Professor in the Atmospheric Science Group at Texas Tech University, uh, where it's uh, 107 today. Did we get any higher than that? Uh, so I'm glad I'm here. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about uh, some data processing we're doing with data from an instrument that we operate called the Lightning Mapping Array. Um, this is a, an instrument that uh, triangulates uh, the VHF spherics um, produced by lightning. You can think of uh, radio noise produced um, that you can hear on the AM radio if you tune in during a thunderstorm. Um, and those little, uh, little spherics are produced by uh, the actual stepping process of the lightning channel that you can think of as the little kinks in the lightning channel as it, uh, as it moves along. Um, so this is before the bright flash. Um, you can see one station uh, here uh, in, in a photo, and we have uh, 10 stations deployed around uh, Lubbock County. Uh, this is what our, uh, our map of stations looks like in, uh, in uh, West Texas. Uh, we do 3D mapping in this sort of 100-kilometer uh, radius around, uh, around Lubbock, and then there's a 2D mapping of the channels uh, at, at a much longer range uh, with a sort of fall-off in detection efficiency. Um, uh, so there's some detail there about uh, how we record the data. Uh, for a, a typical lightning flash, because we sample um, every 80 microseconds at each of these stations and time tag with GPS, um, a typical lightning flash will produce 100 to 1,000 sources, depending on how big the flash is. Um, so here's a, here's a very... Uh, sort of dull scene um, uh, as, as these things go. Uh, this is a simple uh, case with four lightning flashes. Um, you see 35 seconds of total time. Uh, on the top panel, there's uh, a time versus height plot. And then the, uh, the, the big uh, square on the lower left is a top-down view. And then uh, east-west verse, uh, east -west versus height above that and to the right, uh, north-south versus height. So this shows you all of the different dimensions of the data that we retrieve uh, for each of these flashes. Um, this is sort of as, the, as a set of storms are dying, and, uh, and uh, so this is a very low flash rate compared to what you can get in a, a big storm. Um, if we zoom in on this, uh, this red flash here, um, you can see there's loads and loads of uh, resolution in the, in the data. Um, uh, this is about one second worth of data produced by a, a relatively large flash. Um, color indicates time in this uh, in this plot, so uh, evolving from blue through uh, green to yellow and red. Um, we can see some physics here, um, which is why why I care to run the instrument. Um, you can see this episodic extension of the lower level negative channel, um, and then there's a continuous propagation in this this upper positive channel. And if you compare the uh, uh, compare the colors, um, say, in this uh, southern portion of the flash, um, you can see that there's some, some pauses in the extension. So you get this continuous extension for a while in the blue and then a, a pause in the green. And uh, we're going to talk about clustering um, this stream of point data into lightning flashes, and those pauses cause us some trouble, as you'll see later. Um, Let's see, we're, I'm in a GIS session, so I specifically wanted to address GIS and how I deal with, uh, with these uh, VHF sources that uh, are, are four-dimensional, latitude, longitude, time, altitude. Um, many of the GIS tools are out there that are uh, in, available in Python or, or more generally are uh, two-dimensional. Um, mine are four-dimensional, and the... Uh, the time coordinate also matters. I'm limited in terms of the standard time precision in, uh, in the date time library, which is microsecond. I need more on the order of nanosecond time precision. Uh, so I use float seconds since it reference date time. Um, and uh, because of all these limitations, I work at a fairly low level in, in PyProj, and it's a, it's a great wrapper that uh, sort of handles, uh, handles what I need. Um, I use a uh, Earth-centered Earth fixed coordinates as, uh, as sort of my API for going back and forth between different coordinate systems. Um, I maintain my vertical coordinate, and I can do things like project my geographic data into weather radar coordinate systems to do uh, subsetting based on weather radar scans through these uh, lightning flashes. Um, okay, so moving on to these flash sorting algorithms, um, I'd like to automatically separate the VHF sources into flashes. Um, there's uh, several existing implementations um, that I can go find references for in the, in the literature. Here are some of them. Um, 
as is often the case with scientific uh, algorithms written by domain specialists, um, that code is all quasi-private, and so you can email someone and get a copy of their code. Um, so that's one of the things that uh, we'll talk about later, um, how we rectify that. Each of those algorithms use a, um, some variation on grouping by, uh, by space and time. So just thresholds are the, are the points close enough that I can call them a cluster. A typical 15 uh, uh, hundredths of a second and three kilometers. Um, all right, so that's the setup for our flash sorting problem. Um, here's the, uh, the overall processing tool chain. Um, if you were here last year, I showed a, a version of this figure as well. Um, you can see uh, each, of the, each of the steps, and what we're interested in is this box in the, the lower left corner uh, that has uh, a green square called uh, points to flashes, which is presently uh, implemented as a Fortran algorithm that I got by emailing my colleague and asking if I could use his algorithm. Um, uh, so there's that Fortran algorithm. It's uh, a single script written by a scientist with interwo interwoven I.O. and processing. Um, I wrote this whole wrapper around it to be able to trigger it from Python, uh, to be able to use it uh, quickly. And I uh, wind up rereading the Fortran's ASCII output uh, back into a NumPy array, so it's fairly inefficient, actually. Um, probably could do better with F2Py, but... Um, uh, and, and then that, that algorithm, because it incorporates all the I.O., also uh, is sensitive to file format changes, and all of this together makes it uh, hard to maintain. So what I'd like to do is replace that Fortran algorithm uh, with a, uh, a flash sorting algorithm implemented in Python. Um, and it turns out in, uh, in scikit-learn, there's a, there's a clustering algorithm that, uh, that will do this. Um, this is the uh, DB scan algorithm is uh, a density-based algorithm for flash clustering. And um, that, uh, that implementation is uh, order, of n, order n squared efficient. You can do a n log n uh, algorithm, but uh, what they have in there right now is n squared. Um, the, the idea of using time-space thresholds to, uh, to cluster things corresponds very nicely to density, so we'd expect these uh, two methods to, uh, to work similarly. Um, one of the constraints for the LMA data, um, as you can tell, we have a very high data rate, so uh, about 10 to the fifth points per minute uh, uh, of, of data. Um, and uh, so I can't send 10 to the fifth points to DB scan, it blows up. Um, and uh, so I can't do the, the clustering in the naive way I'd like to. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll exploit the fact that the physics are constrained to being at most a few seconds long per flash to do a, a streamed chunked version of the processing. Uh, so here's how that works. Um, I take a, I, I look at a VHF uh, point source buffer with a length that's twice the, possible, twice the maximum possible flash duration. Um, and so there's my max flash duration and a set of points uh, um, where the colors correspond to individual different flashes. Um, and I'll look at a buffer that's twice that length. And then I'll sort that with DB scan, pull out four flashes. And then I'm in my second cycle, I'll grab another chunk of points and use those points that didn't sort into flashes that are part of the first original chunk. Um, so that process repeats onward and uh, it just keeps, uh, com keeps moving along. Um, the, the Python method I chose to, uh, to implement this, uh, this chunked processing um, is a, a pipeline based on, on coroutines. I'll give you a reference for it. I'll look that up later. Um, what, uh, what happens here is there's a, a, a the, this top level stream function that takes a uh, NumPy array, loops over that array and sends out the individual point vectors. Um, and then there's a, there's a target that that's sent to. Um, and this is uh, using the low level um, generator protocol in, uh, in Python to do this. So that, uh, that dot send is a, a sort of Python native thing. Um, and then, uh, so the, the chunk coroutine that you see below there is the, uh, is the target of this uh, vector stream. Um, there's a little bit of setup at the beginning of that function that uh, uh, sets up a buffer and figures out what the next, uh, next time is that represents the end of that window I'm processing. And then at, this, uh, at the yield statement, 
um, where we see V equals yield. A, uh, a new vector is uh, deposited into the function in this, in this coroutine stream. Um, and uh, then we just look at the time of that vector that's arrived. We assume there, there's time ordered. And uh, if that max possible duration for the flash is exceeded, uh, we uh, send that chunk of data onto the next step where we do the clustering. Um, and then when we run out of data, we get this generator exit exception that, that's raised by the, by the generator protocol. And uh, we just deal with the leftovers um, there. Uh, so the next uh, next step in the uh, in the in the process then is the the function that actually uh, does the the DB scan. Um, so again, there's this setup at the beginning. You can see the uh, the call to DB scan. Um, I get the first chunk, and then I have a continuous loop that receives the next chunk. I do the clustering, which is the, uh, the pair of three lines there. I uh, follow that by um, pulling out the data that, uh, that belong to the, uh, that represent the flashes that correspond to the first chunk, and then uh, reserve anything that's left over for the next round, and then it just runs through this loop again when another chunk is pushed into this uh, function. Uh, and then again, at the end, we process the leftovers. Um, Okay, so uh, what's it look like to set up one of these, these processing pipelines? It's a little bit of a different way of thinking about the problem, actually, than uh, a usual sort of sequential function uh, process. Um, it, so there's uh, some pre-processing to do the PyProj transformation. So I've got my, uh, my overall um, complete data set that I'm working with. Um, I create, this, create a normalized vector, which is um, uh, in zero to one space in all coordinates. Um, relative to the, uh, the time thresholds. And then uh, I set up this pipeline. And you notice that when you set up one of these, these, uh, these coroutine-based pipelines, um, you actually set it up in reverse order. So you set up the endpoint first, and then you work your way backward. And the last line there is the stream thing that sends data to the chunker. Um, OK, so. Um, Algorithmic details having uh, been described, uh, how does it work? Uh, probably actually worse in this example than the original algorithm. Um, but um, as I mentioned when we first looked at this, uh, this lightning flash, um, there's these sort of pauses in the extension of the channel, and that causes some problems for the clustering algorithm. And you can see both algorithms fail in about the same place uh, on the flash with, um, with uh, the, the furthermost extents of, of those channels uh, getting split off into new clusters. Um, um, however, that's, that's re so really this new implementation is no worse than the old algorithm. And it, when, it, when it fails, it does so in similar ways. Um, and the point of this talk, anyway, is not the algorithm correctness. Um, really what I want to emphasize is that uh, the I'd, I'm able to use an algorithm for clustering that's developed by algorithm professionals and that's uh, nicely isolated um, as a dedicated function. Um, and that algorithm has been peer reviewed and not the results of the paper using an algorithm for a science purpose um, as, as was the case before. Um, and so that lets me focus on my area of expertise which is not clustering and uh, uh, and I also now at the end of this process have an algorithm that I can share with other colleagues. Um, and, and this is one of the things that I, I love about working in, in SciPy, right, is, the, uh, is that Python winds up being this home for reference implementations, very good reference implementations of these sort of solved problems in computer science. I don't have time to learn all of computer science, um, but I want to use it. And so we have things like dictionaries and arrays and machine learning um, that are, tend to be fairly reliable and obvious and well documented, and that uh, speeds my time to get work done. Um, one of the things that we, we do here then um, is uh, we're, you know, we're building on top of these multiple layers of open source, and I've had the pleasure of being able to extend that to uh, um, another level by taking the code that I've developed, and I'm able to share it. Um, and so a graduate student at Colorado State uh, who created this figure you see on the right um, was able to take my code. Um, he compared it to a third flash sorting algorithm um, that I haven't shown you. Um, found results within 10%, so that was good to see. We have some community uh, validation of these tools. 
Um, and then he also was able to integrate my code base in with some existing storm cell tracking and, uh, and plotting functionality that he has, uh, has already built, um, uh, which is helping to satisfy some NSF-sponsored uh, work uh, that we were funded to do as a part of a large field campaign. Um, also, uh, um, he was able to uh, identify some bad assumptions I made during implementation, and I expect to be able to take those things that he found uh, modify my code and uh, make it better for future use. So that's the, the usual open source advantages right there. Um, future plans for this sort of pipeline based uh, idea that I described. Um, I'm uh, planning to work on uh, work this week on uh, extending the pipeline into this uh, sort of triggered version uh, where uh, after, for instance, adjusting a plot in matplotlib, you trigger the, the head end of that pipeline and uh, trigger a resubsetting of the data as data flows through the pipe, and then that gets dumped out at a plot, or maybe you might dump it to a data file or uh, anything else. Uh, there's a preliminary version of that that's, uh, that's on GitHub that resulted from last year's SciPy sprints, um, and uh, we'll, we'll see how well this goes this week. Um, if you want to look at the uh, the actual flash sorting code and my coordinate system handling code, that's available as well um, at that address. And uh, if you want to read about coroutines, um, David Beasley uh, recently updated the Python cookbook, and uh, he he talks about them in there and links to some other uh, materials on his website that uh, do a very nice job of helping you get oriented to that. So uh, with that, that's uh, all I have. Yeah, it, it's definitely slower. I haven't benchmarked it, but it's still faster than real time on busy data sets that, uh, uh, from, from a big storm case. So that's fast enough and uh, much more easily maintainable. So I'm happy. Other questions? Okay. 